Many of you, but perhaps not all of you, know that executing these large complex programs is a unusual mixture of science and engineering and politics and budget and interpersonal communication and all sorts of things. And a decade ago, I had the opportunity to completely restructure the Mars program. So the mission queue that you've seen for the last 10 years was created uh, in that chaos that came out of the loss of the two Mars 98 missions. Uh, after years of arm twisting by some of my colleagues who said, you know, uh, how often is it that a decade's worth of mission actually survives the Washington process, you must write this down. So I finally wrote it down. Uh, this will be out in January. It's called Exploring Mars, Chronicles from a Decade of Discovery, uh, forward by my buddy, Bill Nye, the science guy. And I think the content of this, because I go into the fallout from Faster, Better, Cheaper, the interaction of personalities, a lot of the backstory. This is a personal story. It's not a textbook. Uh, uh, a lot of the, what it takes and what these gentlemen like Paul Hertz and what Orlando Figueroa until very recently, Steve Saunders and others have to deal with uh, in the Washington environment. So thank you for your indulgence. Now, let me talk about uh, the, the project manager and the management process in the context of a mission that I had the opportunity to manage uh, almost 15 years ago. I was really delighted, though, to see the discussion of WIRE. Um, when I served on the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, and I was the only NASA person there, which is an unusual experience in and of itself, uh, we discovered that the Navy was absolutely insistent that every person that went through the Naval Academy, every person that signed up for the Submarine Corps, study the Thresher accident. Understand not only the technical cause, but the organizational cause. And when we did the Columbia Review and published our findings, it was equal weight technical and management issues. And our summary conclusion after looking at this was that NASA does not generally do a good job of looking at its failures as well as its successes. And often, as everybody knows, you learn more from your failures than your successes. So uh, in this case, uh, I have a success to report. Uh, I was the NASA manager of this mission from for uh, its proposal stage up through uh, 1998, when it was well into its data collection mission. It was uh, created to understand the distribution of elements, the composition of the moon, its resources, and then, of course, that leads us to understanding the origin and evolution of the moon. It was right in the crosshairs of Dan Golden's Faster, Better, Cheaper initiative. And so at this point, he was saying things to us NASA people like, you're all just a bunch of dumb bureaucrats. Write checks and stay out of the way. And uh, of course, we all saluted. Uh, uh, but occasionally, I would violate that, but I didn't tell Dan. <laughs> you have to use your judgment. You have to look at the case that's in front of you and the situation you're facing and decide what is the proper balance of insight and oversight, what's the right way to deal with your particular uh, configuration. We were the first. Lunar Prospector was the very first competitively selected discovery mission. Uh, discovery was created as a way of doing competitive PI-led small planetary missions. And of course, it drew on a lot of the history of the Explorer program. But we were feeling our way. And as you'll see, the management construct that we came up with was somewhat unusual, but it was a way of adapting to the situation at hand. We also had a goal, and this was the beginnings of uh, major efforts that we now have in education and public outreach uh, for the planetary program. We had to invent a number of things on the fly. So this mission uh, had six experiments, five instruments, gamma ray spectrometer, neutron spectrometer, electron reflectometer, a magnetometer, 
and an alpha proton X-ray in a radio experiment. Um, the mission was, a, as you will see shortly, a lunar orbiter. Uh, it was built around the bus that was designed for the Iridium communications satellites. Spin stabilized like the, the pioneers that were done for so many years at Ames. Uh, and was, in everything that we did, we hoped the model of simplicity. The total cost, $63 million, which I think is still the record for planetary missions. Uh, You'd have to inflate that to today's dollars, but it's still well below what it typically takes to do that type of an investigation. Um, the five instruments, which uh, largely came from Los Alamos National Lab, as well as UC Berkeley, about three and a half million. Uh, the total cost for the spacecraft and all the analysis, 22 million. The launch vehicle is 26 million. Now, someone years ago started the scurrilous rumor that this mission got a free launch. Not true. That was incorporated into the price of, uh, of the mission and so forth. One thing that I'll point out and come back to uh, was the award fee because, again, we were feeling our way as to how NASA would deal with the contractor community and the PI in this cost-constrained world uh, where you had the administrator breathing down your neck telling you faster, better, cheaper, and of course you had a lot of grizzled seasoned project managers in the back of the room mumbling to themselves, well you can have any two or three, but you can't get all three. So it was a balancing act. In addition, uh, we had to put in, and this was the uh, beginnings of this requirement, a substantial allocation for education and outreach. And we weren't sure exactly how we were going to do that, other than the web was emerging as the tool for communication. From authority to proceed uh, to launch, 22 months. So this was the faster part. And to achieve this required, as you've heard over and over again, and we'll continue to hear, a lot of teamwork, a lot of communication, a lot of clarity of roles and responsibilities. Um, we did have a six month extended mission at a lower altitude. We started off at 100 kilometers as we got very comfortable with operating that. Uh, it was operated from, from NASA Ames where the pioneers had been controlled. Uh, we were able to move in closer and improve the footprint, improve the physical resolution of these instruments, particularly those that whose resolution was really a, a function of the altitude. <coughs> uh, watched January 6th uh, from, uh, C, from CCAFS, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Uh, took 105 hours to get there, <coughs> went into orbit around the moon, uh, initial injection, and then circularized it. And so within about five days, we were safely in orbit around the moon collecting data. Um, and as everyone in this room who has been through uh, launch, cruise, orbit insertion knows, those are all white knuckle points in your life. And in particular, since this was the first use of the Athena 2 launch vehicle, I remember walking outside, looking up at the moon, and uh, thinking, well, either tomorrow, launch day will be a success, or the end of your career. <laughs> you will have several of these as you go through these missions. Because there's always something. Sometimes there's multiple things. There's always something that you lose sleep over and that you just put as much attention as you can because you make your own luck. You know, if you are diligent and work through everything and do uh, all the mitigation you can think of, you will in fact create your own luck. So we used a simple spin stabilized uh, spacecraft. In fact, uh, this is one urban legend that's actually true. Uh, I was walking with uh, Tom Doggerty who was the Lockheed project manager. We made considerable use of the fact that NASA Ames and Lockheed Sunnyvale right next to each other. So a, a virtual uh, de facto co-location. We were able to not add extra meetings. We, the NASA management people that control the contract, 
and uh, for the PI, who was an employee of Lockheed Martin, would use their review cycle, sit in their reviews, raise questions if we needed to. There was nothing hidden. We were walking down, uh, looking around the facility there, and Tom was showing us bonded stores. And uh, there was this trapezoidal shaped thing sitting in one of the clean room bonded stores. And I said, Tom, what's that? And he said, oh, that's, that's the Iridium bus. I said, well, you think you can get it? He said, well, I don't know, maybe so, because we'd already planned to use that architecture. So in fact, we got the Iridium bus that wasn't used out of bonded stores so we could kickstart the whole process of building spacecraft. Heritage is a word that gets overused, and it's something that the, the TEMCO teams, the review teams, are now starting to look at very skeptically. In this case, uh, it was more or less true. The systems and subsystems that are in here had a long series of development. We had the Mark V version in most cases. It was largely single string, but we did have operational redundancy. You could have an omnidirectional antenna backup for the directional antenna. We found other ways of having graceful degradation, which is the term of art I'm sure you've heard. The critical part of all this, though, since it was mostly single string, except for the, some of the, uh, the transmission, uh, was test. And you've heard test as you fly, fly as you test. Uh, Charlie Hall, the legendary uh, manager of Pioneer 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, Pioneer Venus, was still alive when I arrived at Ames. And I went and said, what's your secret sauce, Charlie? You know, how did you bring all, I mean, they're, they're legendary for being on cost, on schedule, on budget. They said, well, get good parts and test the hell out of everything. He firmly believed that with selected exemptions, you didn't need to have completely duplicative or redundant systems, that single string would be just fine, provided you really tested everything that you needed to test. And in our case, even though we were under tremendous pressure of faster, better, cheaper, and unfortunately the box the Mars 98 people were put in forced them to not be able to have all the testing of the flight hardware and the flight software. Here, we were able to contract the schedule, but we didn't skip any prudent project steps. We didn't let the faster, better, cheaper pressure cause us to do anything you would not normally do for a regular mission. The operations, uh, we converted the old Pioneer uh, Center into Lunar Prospector at Ames. We did extensive thinking in advance of what would we do if we had something that was not uh, in the mainstream plan, what was off nominal, something anomalous, what would be our recovery plan. The big risk that we did take in the entire mission was the use of the Athena 2. Uh, the Athena 1, uh, which was a one-stage version based on the fleet ballistic missile core, which of course had thousands and thousands of successful launches, uh, was a single-stage version that had a very spectacular failure. And then Lockheed Martin, they just merged. By the way, we had to do this in the middle of the merger of Lockheed and Martin Marietta. Uh, did pay for a successful single flight, single stage flight of the Athena 1. But we were the first one to use the Athena 2. So we had review teams crawling up our back, uh, you know, following us around. We had reviews morning, noon, and night. We, I remember going to Denver, sitting in a review at the uh, Lockheed Martin plant responsible for this on December 22nd. Nevertheless, all the analysis showed that this would work. And I remember asking Charlie Hall, um, so what's better, Charlie, to be on the first launch or the second launch of this new vehicle? He said, go with the first one. I said, why is that? He said, because everybody's watching every detail. You've got the A team. You've got management from top down scrutinizing everything. They'll get sloppy on the second launch. The <laughs> second launch was Iconos, which failed because of a problem in what's called pogoing, where the, the pins separated and a signal didn't unzip the fairing and it came back together. 
But um, we made, uh, I think, our own luck there by paying attention to the details. The management challenges were manage the cost but maximize mission success on a short schedule. Had to balance teamwork with the accountability that's already been mentioned. Ultimately, these are taxpayers' dollars that you have to explain to NASA and to the American people. You have to develop, we ended up developing some management tools without sacrificing prudent process. And we were the first to accommodate this new role, at least for planetary missions, where the project manager worked for the PI. And I have to say that uh, we went through one failure with that at Lockheed Sunnyvale. Uh, I went uh, together with the PI to, uh, since I was on the NASA side of the fence, uh, to say this isn't working. And they were highly responsive. We had an instantaneous change which worked out extremely well. Um, how did we uh, make all this work? We froze the design. We developed it without deviation. We tried to minimize the staff but have a good mix of senior and junior people. So we contained cost but had the right level of oversight. And we had a well-defined data return. This has been mentioned already. Um, this was the group that worked together on the NASA side. Uh, we had the contract with Lockheed Martin where the PI was in fact an employee of Lockheed Martin, so it's an unusual situation with uh, the other groups that have been already been mentioned by Steve Saunders. So we balanced what's now called insight with oversight, <coughs> simplified systems, but prudent practice. Uh, the award fee was very important to Lockheed Martin, and I told the senior management if they did it, uh, properly, I would give them the maximum award fee allowed by law, which is 15%. They did, and I did, and it worked out extremely well. Subcontracts are all fixed price, and Tom Doggerty was just a master since he knew the organization at moving people on and off, so they didn't charge the contract any longer than they absolutely had to. So we exploited the proximity of NASA Ames being next to Sunnyvale, minimized the team side, uh, but maintained continuity. We combined these in-depth reviews with normal milestones. We didn't have duplicate uh, uh, meetings or reviews, and we used Lockheed Martin's contractor systems wherever possible. So in the end, uh, we met our goal of a very short development. We stayed inside the cost box. First use of the vehicle was successful. And in the fledgling world of education and outreach, 100 million hits is trivial now, but at the time, 10 years ago, it was a big deal. So those are the ingredients. I wish you all the success in the world to make them work for your project.